Tonight, I'm going to talk about pathways. First, imagine the typical pathway that a founder takes to start a high-growth business. What schools, background, experience come to mind? Now, imagine that there's an alternative path and that Endeavor has groundbreaking research proving that this new path is just as, if not more, effective. In a few moments, I'll share this research. But first, a story. It's the story of one of the most iconic founders of the 20th century, and yet one you've probably never heard of, because this founder took that new path. Her name was Hedwig Eva Maria Kiesler. Born in Vienna in 1914, she becomes fascinated by theater and film. At 16, she forges a note from her mother and gets hired as a script assistant at a local movie studio. Hedwig quickly turns this behind-the-scenes job into a vehicle for stardom. Her first breakout role in the film Ecstasy earns her critical acclaim but causes public outrage for the film's 60-second nude scene and the first public display of female pleasure. At 18, Hedwig marries Fritz Mondal, a Viennese arms dealer with ties to Mussolini and Hitler. Though she was born Jewish, Hedwig accompanies Fritz to countless meetings with Nazis, but her marriage is unbearable. So one night, she steals her maid's outfit and flees to Paris, where she obtains a divorce. She soon meets legendary Hollywood film producer Louis B. Mayer and convinces him to take a bet on her. Mayer has one stipulation. To distance herself from the ecstasy scandal, Hedwig Kiesler must change her name. And so, Hollywood's leading lady, Hedy Lamarr, is born. Mayer deems her the most beautiful woman in the world. She stars alongside Hollywood's leading men, Spencer Tracy, Jimmy Stewart, Clark Gable. Hedy resents being known just for her beauty, famously quipping, any girl can look glamorous. All she has to do is stand still and look stupid. Her real passion is invention. She's always been a tinkerer, and now the bored actress wants to put her ideas to good use. Hetty believes she can help the Allies defeat the Nazis. After all, she took lots of business notes in those business meetings with her husband, the ex-arms dealer. No one takes her seriously. Then, in 1940, at a dinner party, she meets the bad boy of music, George Antile. Their conversation quickly turns from Hollywood gossip to torpedoes. Hetty has this theory of how radio-guided torpedoes could avoid being detected by enemy ships. George is intrigued. He's working in Hollywood for the pay, but like Hetty, he's bored. His real passion is avant-garde music. George tells Hetty about this score he's composed. So cacophonous and so long, it gets cut from the film. So he responds by repurposing the score as a concert for 16-player pianos, where the music randomly hops from one piano to another. Hetty immediately senses how they could translate George's piano-hopping music to her theory of radio-controlled torpedoes. She writes her phone number in lipstick on his car windshield, and the two get to work. Within two years, the pair develops a secret communication system to prevent Allied torpedoes from being jammed by Nazi ships. Their invention of frequency hopping enables radio signals to be sent randomly across 88 frequencies, thereby evading enemy detection. They choose 88 frequencies in homage to a piano's 
88 keys. In August 1942, the United States issues this patent to the pair. The first name listed is Hetty's, and she proudly hands over the patent to the U.S. Navy, which proceeds to bury the patent in a safe and classifies the technology. Hetty is told that if she wants to help the war effort, she should sell kisses for war bonds. Frequency hopping is forgotten until the 1960s, when the Navy dusts off the patent and uses the classified technology to boost signals among U.S. vessels during the Cuban Missile Crisis. By then, George has died, and Hetty receives neither royalties nor recognition. She does get her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 1981, President Reagan declassifies Hetty's frequency hopping technology, making it available for commercial use. Cell phones, Bluetooth, GPS, and Wi-Fi all owe their existence in part to Hetty's invention. Had she retained commercial rights to her patent, her royalties today would be worth over 30 billion dollars. Hers is not a Hollywood happy ending. Hetty dies a recluse and is only posthumously inducted into the National in Inventors Hall of Fame. But hers is a story of rethinking founder pathways. So for 26 years, we at Endeavor have been saying that entrepreneurship is not just for boys in hoodies living in Silicon Valley who went to Stanford. But this year, we wanted to use data to back up our statement. As you all walked through the entryway, you passed through a year-long project conducted by Endeavor Insight, our research arm. We studied the pathways of unicorn founders, those who build a privately held company valued of at least a, a billion dollars. Our data set comprised 200 unicorns, the top 100 unicorns from the US, shown here in purple lines, and the top 100 from emerging markets, shown in teal, which includes 30 Endeavor entrepreneurs. Our conclusion, yeah, you can clap. <laughs> Our conclusions shattered four myths about the pathway to becoming a unicorn. Old path. Unicorn founders attend Stanford, MIT, Harvard, or another top-tier university. New path. Only a third of unicorn founders graduate from an elite university. Two-thirds are either self-taught or attend a lower-ranked school. Old path. These founders major in business as undergrads, and many get MBAs. New path. 61% of founders major in science and engineering, as compared with only 19% studying business, and only one in five get MBAs. Old path. Successful tech entrepreneurs are young. They start their startup, they launch their startups in their dorm rooms or garages. New path. The majority of unicorn founders average over 10 years of work experience before launching their startup. Old path. Any relevant work experience they may have takes place at a big five tech firm or a top tier bank or consulting firm. New path. Only 20% of founders come from big name firms. 80% either found or work for another startup. So, what do these new pathways mean for the next generation? This gets to the heart of Endeavor's work. We have shown when one underrepresented founder succeeds, then shares their story, their knowledge, their resources with future founders, their impact compounds. We call this the multiplier effect. Today, we support 2,500 Endeavor entrepreneurs who have created 4 million jobs, and generate more than $50 billion in revenue. 
but they do, they do so much more. And what keeps me excited after 26 years is the impact they have on the, how they multiply that over cities and countries. Tonight, you'll meet four founders who followed the new pathways and are generating a multiplier effect. A fisherman from Indonesia leading the new worldwide industry of aquaculture tech. We served his fish at, we served his shrimp at cocktail hour. A self-taught engineer from Tunisia who turned a makeshift startup into an AI system that played a major role in resolving the global pandemic. A serial entrepreneur from Uruguay whose recent IPO and personal work mentoring local startups has encouraged a tiny nation to dream big. And tonight's honoree, David Velez, who for me epitomizes the new global citizen entrepreneur. <laughs> Born in Colombia, David and his family fled to Costa Rica when he was nine to escape warring drug cartels. His first investment was a cow. After moving to Brazil, David and two co-founders launched Nubank, which IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange in 2021. Today, Nubank is the largest fintech in Latin America with a market cap of $40 billion. And David embodies the endeavor ethos of paying it forward as a mentor, investor, and philanthropist. David, we're so thrilled to have you, Marielle, and your new bank team here with us, along with so many Endeavor entrepreneurs from across the globe. Will you and the Endeavor entrepreneurs in the room please stand? This evening is all about pathways. Our entrepreneurs pass from big idea to big impact, endeavors path from preposterous, preposterous dream to our role as ecosystem uh, catalyst in 42 markets, and the forgotten paths of some of the world's best ideas that have taken a pathway from Hollywood backlots to dusty safes to the smartphone in everyone's pocket. As Hedy Lamar told her children in this clip, new paths are not easy to navigate. Others will surely call you crazy. The biggest people with the biggest ideas can be shut down by the smallest people with the smallest mind. Think big anyway. Or as I like to say, Hedy, crazy is a compliment.